Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of the Striker Texas podcast. We're back for another episode to talk about your favorite Texas USL teams, whether you're a fan of a Paso Locomotive or you're a fan of a San Antonio FC or an RGV FC fan. This is the podcast for you. This is one of the few podcasts, if not the only one, that talks about all three Texas USL teams and uh, gives their their thoughts about what's going on within the the news or within the worlds there in these three cities. I'm obviously not alone. We've got the two beat reporters from San Antonio and El Paso Locomotive, and we'll give a shout out first to the 210 area with Jonathan Check. Jonathan, how are you? Doing all right. Um, I've noticed a, a fly flying around my room within the last half hour or so. So uh, if you're watching the video of this, if you see me flail, flail around madly, uh, that's what's going on. And if you're just listening to the podcast and you hear some crashing and, I don't know, maybe an explosion or two, uh, that's what's happening. Kill it with fire! Yeah, oh, where's my flamethrower? Hmm, good idea. I, I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. You're, if you're gonna go all in, you gotta. If you're gonna do it, you're gonna go all in. And now we jump over to the over to the borderlands, where our friend Joe Rodriguez is waiting to give his thoughts about the locomotive. Joe, how's it going? Edson, Jonathan, how's it going, boys? Uh, it's good to be back with you for another week of the Striker Tech Has. Um, obviously, uh, locomotive uh, had a break this past weekend. Uh, but uh, they have another important match coming up. We'll get into it. It's good to see you. Good to be here. And uh, all things are good over here out in the borderland. I think what our listeners really care about, Joe, is did you have a break? Uh, not hardly, man. Uh, between uh-huh. uh, FC Juarez and, uh, and the UTEP minor football team, uh, collegiate football team, yeah, it's uh, keeping busy out here and stuff like that. But it's all good. Uh, it's better to be busy than to be bored and not doing anything on the weekends and not catching any sporting events. <laughs> That's pretty true. So, and all the way here from the 956, my name is Seton Ochoa. I'm the beat reporter for uh, RGBFC. And we finally have some uh, good news coming out of HV Park, which we'll be talking about uh, in a minute. But let's go ahead and start with uh, San Antonio uh, FC, who they did have a, a match uh, this uh, past Saturday. Uh, over at uh, Toyota Field, they hosted San Diego Loyal. Uh, the last time these two teams faced each other was in California, where pretty much the Loyal had San Antonio's number. And it looks like uh, for this game, it was a little bit different. What can you tell us, Jonathan? Yeah, so uh, first of all, just reflecting on the initial meeting of these teams in, well, even before the, the meeting five weeks before this match. Um, There was technically a a first ever meeting between the two in the playoffs last year. It was San Diego's first match. So uh, there, there were some questions of, you know, maybe did they hold a grudge? Did they kind of get some revenge out of their system when they beat SAFC 3-0 in August? Uh, And then reflecting on that particular match in San Diego at Torreira stadium, Alan Marcina uh, multiple times said, you know, we, we feel like we weren't, so bad in the first half uh but weren't able to capitalize and then the second half san diego just kind of took over uh it was sort of three goals within the last half hour so uh it's not that safc got completely dominated there but um i i think i said at the time didn't really have the the forward depth uh at the time had a few players out and just couldn't relieve the pressure that San Diego was putting them under. Um, Now, getting to this most recent match, SAFC, again, down a few attacking players, but uh, was able to create enough offensively um, and perhaps even more crucially, got a goal half an hour in, uh, and San Diego didn't really have too many chances throughout the match. I think, you know, Jordan Farr was saying after the match, yeah, you know, I made some saves, but... Uh, it was very rare tonight that I had to make any, you know, big saves, um, you know, that there were difficult shots I was facing, uh, with the exception probably of one moment about an hour in San Diego gets a penalty, which, uh, looking at the replay, I think was justified. I think Mohamed Abu, um, was maybe hoping the ball would go across the, the player's, you know, body and he'd stick a foot in, get a, a toe in the ball, uh. It, it did not get anywhere near 
where Boo put his tackle in, so I think it was a justified penalty. Um, but in this case, maybe you can say the there, there's this saying, oh, you know, the, the ball doesn't lie. In this case, maybe the ball lied because Jordan Farr said, I, I saw the guy as soon as the penalty was awarded. I just watched the guy who was going to take it, and I knew pretty instantly uh, where he was going to place that. And sure enough, Jordan Farr dives down to his right, uh, stops the ball, and then collects it. He doesn't let it... Uh, sit in front of him for too long and I I would almost say that was the biggest moment of the match um Jordan Farr said after you know after the match when we were doing interviews kind of that was uh, a big moment uh I he, he said it was the first penalty save of his career and he also mentioned Carter Manley came up to him right after that moment was just like we're gonna win this which I guess kind of tells you like you know okay um that was their one big chance you know we're, we're not gonna let them get any others and we're going to do the job from here on out. We're going to see out this lead. And I think that's something that SAFC did really well. They managed this game, um, got the goal when they needed to. I, I, I said, I don't know where it was exactly, but SAFC just came up in big moments, um, particularly to score the goal and to save the penalty. And, you know, especially getting down to the playoffs, that's what you've got to do sometimes is just come up big in big moments. Yeah, and I think it's... Uh, I- I think after all the questions, you know, that we were we were talking about last last week, uh, it was kind of like a, a it's kind of like a good sign to kind of see them getting back into their groove. Uh, San San Antonio uh, getting that confidence. Like I mean, you mentioned Carter Manley after that penalty save, like it gave the team uh, confidence. But Carter Manley was the one that mentioned it. The team gave the team confidence that hey, we can get a result. You know, so going into the playoffs, I'm pretty sure that is that is going to be a good run of form that San Antonio is going to try to continue as we end to to the end of uh, of this uh, of the season. And one of the things that kind of caught me off guard, you, know, you mentioned, you know, that Jordan Farr uh, said that well, they didn't have like San, San Diego didn't have a lot of uh, opportunities where I had to kind of dive. I think they only had four shots on target, but so did San Antonio. Does that continue to worry uh, you as a, as a, as an analyst, a reporter? Does that is that worrying the fans, or is it one of those things where as long as the the team gets the the three points, it's uh, that falls kind of into second fiddle. So we, if anyone, I, I hope this isn't. I, I highly doubt this is anyone's first time listening to this podcast. Uh, I know I've said a number of times before that SAFC will sometimes create a lot of really good chances and not finish them off. And whenever I do that, or wh- whenever SAFC does that, I'll ask Alan Marcina typically post game, you know, is this concerning to you? And he, he pretty much always says no, because when the time comes, they're going to finish these chances. So I mean, as long as SAFC is creating some of those quality chances and finishing them, and then we all know it's one of the best, if not the best defense in the league. So mm-hmm. sometimes taking one of your chances is more than enough. And I, I still kind of looking back at the replay, uh, I'm a little befuddled as to how Koke Vegas doesn't get a hand on that. I guess it was just past his fingertips or, you know, he, he didn't extend his hand out quickly enough, but mm-hmm. uh, Hey, sneaks past him into the bottom right corner. And that was the goal. And SAFC saw that lead out well um, with obviously the penalty save, but also just, you know, good defending and keeping San Diego from, getting a rhythm going forward. Yeah, and um, it was actually a, a weekend of positive results for the two uh, the two games that were played. Uh, as Joe Rodriguez did mention, El Paso uh, had, you can say, a bye week this this past weekend. So the other the other game that was played was uh, RGV uh, hosting New Mexico United uh, at HEB Park. I had mentioned last week that I felt like it was going to be uh, difficult, but not uh, but not hard or, or not impossible. Why I mentioned that is because uh, the the team started to get get into a positive groove offensively and uh, defensively. They were starting to to kind of uh, not lose their concentration as much as in other games, like let's say uh, Phoenix Rising. So the biggest question is: Were was RGB going to replicate? Uh, the same performance they had in in this long away stretch of almost 45 days uh, where they were going to replicate that at HEB Park. And um, 
the game started off a little bit rocky for for the Toros. Um, Amando Moreno gets the the first goal of the night in the eighth minute, and that brought a lot of, a, a lot of concerns to uh, to fans to 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 myself as well. Um, I think a, a lot of the fans that I talked about they thought like, oh well, here we go. Here's the same old Toros of of our HB Park again, right? Um, and uh, at, after the game, you know, I, I talked to Emilio Icasa, I talked to Jonas Fieldberg, uh, obviously with Wilmer Cabrera, but the, but the players mentioned that when that goal happened, it was a wake-up call for them. It's like, no, we can't be doing this again. We need to try and find an equalizer, at least an equalizer before, the, uh, before halftime. And only seven minutes passed uh, from that goal where RGV gets the, gets the equalizer off of a long ball by uh, Wahab Akwe towards uh, Emilio Icasa and beautiful volley. Like he didn't even wait for the for the ball to, to bounce on the ground. Like he hit it right in the, right in the air and left uh, Alex Tambakis pretty much motionless. And so that gave them the equalizer. That boosted the morale. They continue to push. They continue to exert the typical high pressure of Wilmer Cabrera into uh, into this into this game get an equalizer uh, or get the second goal uh, off of Christian Pinzon another individual attack we started to see what Christian Pinzon can bring with his with his footwork like he 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 makes that ball really really tiny and he's able and he's able to get past I think it was like I don't know I'm mistaken it was like five or six New Mexico defenders like at in his vicinity and he was he was still able to get the the shot past uh Alan Tembacus and into the into the net. Second half there was a little bit more domination or or more possession by New Mexico United but the defense held on pretty well. Uh, I think most of the shots from New Mexico had to be from outside the box because they were unable to penetrate the the Toros uh, defense to try to get uh, closer to towards Tyler Derrick. But when it ended up happening, New Mexico started getting desperate. They started pu- pushing their lines really high up, and that left them vulnerable for the counterattack. And one of those counterattacks left them 2v1, and Jonas Fielberg is able to get the final 3-1 score. After the game, Jonas Fielberg says, you know, the, you know this, is, this is one of those games where we, we, need, we realize that w- if we are at 100%, it's going to be difficult for any team in the league to be able to uh, to stop us to 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 score a goal, and so I like the fact that that they are being they are motivated. We were talking. I talked to Christian Pinson yesterday uh, in uh, media availability, and uh, and he was he was talking. You know how much his, his connection with Jonas Fielberg kind of clicked instantly. He mentioned that in Fielberg's first training with the team he knew right away that he was going to link up really well uh it was one of those first impressions that really ended up uh becoming true and you start to see you know that effect in that offense for uh rgvfc now will there probably be a team later on that might probably shut them out you know that could there could be there could be a reason but you know with what this team needs is the motivation and with the the long road ahead to try to salvage a, a playoff spot, they need all the motivation that, that they can get uh, and to try to get a, a good result. I know players typically, and, and I'm sure coaches too, don't want to look to the past too much, don't want to dwell too much on the past, but uh, it seems like RGV is maybe kind of getting a, a bit of a late season resurgence for the second season in a row. Uh, how does it feel like this compares to what RGV was able to do last year? You know, Jonas Fielberg actually brought that up too, because he says it's pretty much a deja vu situation, you know, last year to this year for him. In both years, he came in in the middle of the season with a team that was in a situation where they had to win most of their games for uh, for the what was left of the season to try to salvage a playoff spot, and it seems like in both years they're starting to kind of get that get that uh, lift over to try to repeat this year. Uh, obviously, with with this year, it's completely it's a completely different team, but they feel they feel like uh, with the with the new with the new pieces, um, everything has melt has kind of 
blended together really well so that these results could come in. And I will bring up something that Wilmer Cabrera did say, and I know that Roberto isn't here, but uh, but I asked him, you know. But I am in I'm all ears. <laughs> okay, so I asked Wilmer Cabrera. Okay, Wilmer, so last time we talked, last time we were here, here at HEB Park after a game, the team was struggling. The team couldn't score goals. Uh, you couldn't find, you know, that starting 11 to be able to put some, some, some of these opportunities in the back of the net from then. And now you bring in Fieldberg, you bring in Pinzon and it almost seems like it, it, it clicked instantly. What is it about these two players that, that, uh, revolutionized the attack? And he basically told me these guys are more talented. That's all. I mean, I, if I can summarize what he said is these guys, Fieldberg and Pinzon are more talented than what I had in offense and he's not wrong i'm not gonna re uh, i am there's no arguments that i that anybody can Im uh pretty much imagine or come up with to refute that statement from wilmer it's a, it's just a shame he can't be more eloquent in expressing that thought well I'm, I'm, what do you mean <laughs> come on joe well, i mean, I mean I mean, no, I, I mean, if he's right, he's right. I mean, and you agree with him. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear cut. I'm just saying, you know, just how does that make other people feel? <laughs> or the ones that were there before? Well, uh, I mean, I get your point. I mean, he, at least he didn't say he didn't say like he was with the Houston Dynamo. But it, but to be honest, it is for me, I took it well with the reason that, you know, he's not sugarcoating this anymore. Last right. time I asked him about it he kind of said, well, it's because they barely got here and they're trying to get used to the system, to the, to the location. No, and and, and there was that. also a point where he was saying, you know, well, that's what we have, you know, and that's, I mean, we need, we're lacking in that area. You know, he's acknowledged yeah. that before. I mean, so yeah, no, it's, it's good that, that these two players are delivering for the Torres at such a crucial part of the year. And now they're just what five, Four or five points out of uh, the playoff zone? No, they're actually one. Uh, I, I was about to say, I, I looked a yeah, few minutes one. ago. I think it's just one. And I think they have a game in hand. What are they at? 20... 28. 28. 28. 28. Yeah. So, um, and I mean, you look at some of the form of the teams uh, just above the playoff line. I mean, El Paso has lost two of its last five. Uh, Vegas has lost three of its last five. New Mexico, um, thanks to that win or that, well, win for RGV uh, has lost four of its last five. So, I mean, there are a few teams, and, and even LA Galaxy 2 now has lost two in a row. So, and not, and not only that, them, they can leapfrog easily. And uh, not so only that, what helps them a lot is the goal difference. I think uh, out of all the the teams that are in the uh, outside of the playoffs, I think they're one of the few that actually have a positive goal differential. Everybody else, it, they have negative. But isn't the goal differential like the third or the fourth tiebreaker? For that is very true. Reason? Yes, you are. Say. You are. Yeah, yeah you. It, it, that is USL's very true. Weird. Yeah, but if it, for some reason, it happens to be needed, you know, it's always it's always good to have an advantage in that particular situation. That's definitely good to have that card for sure. Yeah, definitely. So obviously, positive performances from from both, and so now we look we look ahead to what's going to happen. Uh, this in, in this following weekend, uh, now all three teams are going to be are going to be playing, and you've got uh, San Antonio, which will be uh, taking on New Mexico United. So uh, we we loosen them up for y'all, okay? Uh, just just letting just letting San Antonio Nation out there. The Toros loosen them up for you, so uh, take advantage of it. And uh, RGV will be hosting Colorado Springs uh, Switchbacks. Both of these games will be at the same time at seven thirty p.m. Both Texas teams will be uh, at home. And, of course, on Sunday, El Paso Locomotive will be traveling to the dreaded land of California Republic to take on LA Galaxy 2. So we'll, go ahead, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with uh, Jonathan and San Antonio. Jonathan, what are you expecting from this match? First of all, I'll also mention, uh, depending on when we record next week, there might also be another match for SAFC that we can talk about uh, and, and preview here. Um, just like RGV loosened up New Mexico last weekend, uh, they will loosen up Colorado Springs on Saturday so that SAFC can then play them on Tuesday. Um, that is... That's for, a short those, turnaround. I, it is, yeah. Um, and 
it's worth remembering this is a match that was postponed from earlier in the season because of uh, COVID back in May is when this was supposed oh, to happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, it's kind of weird that this was the only time in the season that it apparently worked. I guess maybe it was because, well, heck, we're making the trip down to the Valley anyway. We may as well play SAFC three days later. Um, and that probably explains why it's on like a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday is, you know, mm -hmm. a, a day less of hotels. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's it's going to be the start of a busy week for SAFC, three games in eight days. Um, thankfully, you start with New Mexico, a team that's been in absolute free fall. Um, like I said earlier, four losses in the last five. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they, they're going to want to turn that around sometime. Um, and, you know, you could have said the same thing about Indy 11 a few weeks ago. And what did they do? They beat SAFC 1-0. So uh, you, you can't discount any team. Um, but being at home, you, you would think SAFC's got the momentum. They've got the confidence. Um, it'll be interesting to see who is returning from injury. Uh, I mean, like I said, there were a few guys out this past game. Uh, Nacho Bailone actually got his first start of the season, uh, scored a goal. So mm -hmm. I, even if some of those players come off the injury list, uh, you know, maybe Nacho did well enough to keep his place. But um, yeah, so New Mexico... I, I should think SAFC has what it takes to win that match. And the switchbacks, it's going to be interesting because they're seemingly out of their midseason slump um, and they're going to be trying to push San Diego for second place now. So uh, that that is not a team that's any slouch. You know, earlier in the season for the first few months, they were the top of the division or of the conference, I should say now. So uh, definitely not easy teams. And, and this is actually... I'm going to have an article coming out um, hopefully Friday. I, I mean, well, I think it's already been posted, but uh, you're you're not going to be listening to this until at least Friday. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I have an article about how SAFC has uh, a bit of a, uh, I, I don't want to say a gauntlet, but a run of matches that sort of started with San Diego that's just going to be playoff team after playoff team after playoff team, uh, you know, three at home still to go. and two more away against teams in the Eastern Conference against Pittsburgh and Birmingham, um, neither of which are easy teams in any sense. So uh, SAFC is going to be really tested over this next month. And I think at the same time, you know, if SAFC is able to get most, if not all of these points, um, it, it, they're going to be in great form heading into the playoffs. But uh, you got to take it one game at a time. Can't get ahead of yourself. And I think that's good. What's going to help out... Uh the most San Antonio is that New Mexico United in these last couple of matches, they have not had any clear or very few clear opportunities uh, on goal in this game against the Toros. You, you, they had nine total shots and only two of those were on target. And what the worst part for, for New Mexico. And I saw this when they were warming up, I noticed that the keepers, they, uh, they, I don't know what, I don't know what's happening with Tembacus, but he doesn't either. He doesn't feel confident or, you know, but he was, you know, just like I mentioned, like in the first goal by, uh, by Emilio Vicasa, where he just stood frozen uh, at the shot during warm up, There were multiple times where he looked like that as well. So I think that bad run of form by Tembacus could be something that San Antonio can take advantage. But like you mentioned, you got to put those shots at least on target to at least make Alex Tembacus work for it and then so as i mentioned uh the toros will be hosting colorado springs uh switchbacks and it's going to be a very very diff very difficult f for the toros we know that how the firepower on the offense that colorado springs switchbacks has but we also know that defensively they don't they're not really really good They've let in. They've let in a, a, a lot of goals this season, so that is going to be their their pretty much their Achilles' heel. If RGBFC can maintain possession and get keep the momentum in their favor to get some shots uh, on target, they can probably make uh, make a case to get a positive result at home against the uh, against the switchbacks. Um, I talked to Ricky Ruiz yesterday in media availability about about the game. And one of the things he mentioned, because I brought up, you know, the last time these two teams played uh, where um, Colorado Springs was leading 3-0 uh, 
and then almost at the end of the second half, uh, RGB were close to uh, getting the equalizer. And, and the final score in that game was three to two. Um, Ricky Reese mentioned, you know, first of all, you know, you know, first of all, we can't let Colorado score three goal, three unanswered goals on us and put ourselves uh, that far, that far back. He said, if we could have had more time, we could have probably equalized, or we could have even probably, you know, got gotten the win. But at the end of the day, we can't put ourselves in a situation where we we have to work for it uh, offensively. And he reiterated the fact that. And so did Christian Pinzon, that the team, how they're going to be playing, they are not really focused on what the opponent brings to the table. Same thing was was mentioned against New Mexico United. He said, we're going to try to uh, impose our style of play into the game and 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 let and uh, us be the ones that have the the on the hand in this match and so far for most of these matches i know we mentioned it last time and we and we kind of uh laughed at wilmer when, when he when he mentioned that at practice but i think so far it's proven effective for for wilmer cabrera and at, and in that aspect i feel like i got to give some credit uh to wilmer uh with uh with that statement i think he's proving he he's proving us wrong in in in, in doubting in doubting that so well, hopefully, hopefully we can we can see something similar against Colorado Colorado Springs. And I me- I mentioned you know yesterday on on my pod that you know the fact that we were able to score against the best defense in the Western Conference and we scored on them twice at their home and I'm talking about San Antonio. Yes, we were able to score against I think the fourth best offense, which was New Mexico United, and we scored three on them it should be a little bit easier to be able to score against the fourth worst offense in the Western conference. But we know that a USL championship, that kind of logic really isn't, it, it isn't a given that it's actually going to be playing played out on the field. So, but statistically there is a possibility. Yeah. Sometimes two plus two equals fish in this league. Yes. I am a firm believer and I also a firm believer that burns aren't real. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, Joe, Sunday, really uh, unorthodox day for uh, for soccer for for the locos. But you're traveling over to LA Galaxy too. What are you expecting? Uh, I expect a tough match. Obviously, I don't think it's going to be easy by any means of the 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 imagination. I mean, uh, the locomotive have three matches left in the regular season as. We touched on briefly. Um, I, it seems that everybody that is beneath them in the standings has at least one or two games in hand on El Paso Locomotive. So, you know, nine games left in the regular season. It goes without saying. Um, each and every single one of these three remaining games, um, they're gonna get, they're a must-win situation. And I think for El Paso Locomotive fans, unfortunately, I guess it's good that this team's gonna that this game's gonna be taking place on a Sunday because, uh, frankly, El Paso Locomotive fans. Uh, need to be heavily invested in uh, the matches that involve everyone that is beneath El Paso uh, in the table right now. Obviously, you know, and, and I'm talking about the, the Toros and the Switchbacks game uh, over with um, in Monterey Bay. Hopefully Mark Lowry can take his team over to to the West Coast there in Northern California and 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 do what he does best, put a solid team together and, uh, you know, win on the road up in Monterey. And then, of course, like I said, uh, you know, the, the the other games too, Oakland Roots hosts as New York Red Bulls, uh, San Diego Loyal hopefully takes care of Phoenix Rising, and Sacramento Republic hopefully takes care of OCSC. Um, you know, that's basically what El Paso Locomotive fans need to be invested in all weekend long in following these results. And you want to see uh, the teams below them get absolutely zero points. I mean, that, uh, fortunately for this week, it seems that um, all of the teams below are playing the upper teams in the table. That's just kind of shaping out that way, except for that Monterey Bay game. But then, you know, like I said, hopefully Mark Larry can go in there and do his thing the way he's he, he has the tendency of doing, even though his Indy 11 team hasn't been firing in any regular way uh, throughout the regular season. Um, as for the Galaxy, they're coming in off a loss off of OCSC. 
in a game that I don't think I mentioned it last week in the playoffs. If there was one game that I would have bet my mortgage and the neighbor's mortgage on, it would have been that LA Galaxy OCSC game. There was no way OCSC was going to lose that game at home last week. And they barely got by at 1-0, but a win's a win. And, and it proved, uh, you know, my prediction came to fruition. But yeah, no, definitely. Um, as far as the locomotive go, they've been, they've had a week and a half rest, a week and a half to prepare uh, to hopefully get a win in Southern California and the Golden Coast. And hopefully, you know, you got to think at this point in time, I think, El Paso's like owing a dozen this season going to California. Um, you know, the, the law of averages or the law of percentages has to fall on their side and that 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 streak hopefully will be broken soon and, and El Paso will get three points at uh, a crucial point in this regular season. What's the, what's the overall uh, atmosphere right now? Do you believe that this extended rest is going to be beneficial for the locals or or do you feel like the, the lack of playtime might might prove uh, to play against uh, El, El Paso for this match I don't think it'll I don't think it'll play uh, I, I don't think it'll play against them um, that much I mean I, I don't think it'll be a factor I think this team, this team's too experienced as if anything I think the team welcomed to this rest period at this point of the season uh, you got to remember that last year in that in the in this stretch of the year I think they played nine matches in the last month of the ma- of the of the regular season. So this year um, it's gone the other way for them. And uh, I think they're taking advantage of the break. I think if, you know, not looking forward too much, but I think if El Paso does squeeze into the playoffs, I think they'll be very good and very comfortable and will be set up to play that role of that lower C team, you know, causing havoc on all of those teams that one thinks, you know, are, are going to go deep in the playoffs just because of the regular season record. So, I mean, we'll see what happens, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's only three games for the locomotive left this regular season, but there is a lot of soccer that needs to be played and a lot of results to go for their way to, in order to make that happen. So, um, like I said, locomotive fans need to be invested in what's going on elsewhere because they don't, you know, this team doesn't have that luxury right now to just, you know, get these last nine points of the season and cruise into the playoffs. It, it could get complicated if things don't go their way. Take it from SAFC fans, you don't want to be going to the last match or two of the season, depending on other teams to uh, get you into the playoffs. You, you want to be in control of it yourself. Uh, it did not go SAFC's way in 2016, 2018, um, and even when they had their destiny in their hands in 2019, still slipped through. So sometimes it's, you know, your own team's well, fault. Like, to... or... Or it could go the way of RGV last season. Uh, unfortunately for them, for the locals last season, they were pretty much the victims of uh, RGV uh, making it into the playoffs uh, in 2021. But you know, who never knows? But it is going to be extremely difficult with those uh, uh, with the match number disadvantage compared to uh, most or almost all of the teams uh, in the uh, in the Western Conference. So they have a huge. Uh, huge issue with them that they need to get as many points as possible in, in their last couple of games. So, yeah, I, mean, I mean, they need to get those nine points and they need for results just to go their their way. They don't absolutely need it, but first and foremost, they need to win these last three games. If, if they drop one game, um, I think they have one foot out of the playoffs, frankly. Yeah, definitely. So, now that we've we've talked about the, the upcoming games, um, let's give uh, our predictions of how many how many points are going to be scored, um, or how many yeah how many points are going to be accumulated by the three Texas USL teams this uh, this weekend. Or do you, do you also want to include the Tuesday game? We can uh, to make it four. Uh, I mean, it it depends on if you guys want to record on Monday or not. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's go ahead. Let's put in. Let's put in those. I mean, uh, it's not like these really matter. Okay, this is like whose lines in any way. Okay, everything we say is made up, and the points don't. And the matter, points don't matter. So. Okay, so 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 who who who's calling mockery of this group? <laughs> Dare I say uh, it? Do we need to say I'm it? A, I'm a mime. No, let's let let's let's not let's not. We'll we'll, we'll keep that mystery. We'll keep that a mystery and and let the fans decide. But um, okay, so Jonathan, who, um, how many points, or how do you think? 
Uh, I'm gonna go if if we include the Tuesday match, I'm gonna go with seven points. Seven. Yes. Okay. Joe. I am gonna go with nine. Nine. Yeah. That okay. Sounds about right. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm actually going to go with uh, seven points. I'm gonna. Go, I'm gonna go. With, I'm gonna go with, with with seven points for for the four games, and uh, obviously, well, we kind of we don't have the tally from from two weeks ago. Um, we do have the tally. I, I do recall the answers we gave last week. You gave two, I believe. You, Jonathan, you mentioned, I believe, uh, four. Yeah, four points. And uh, I wasn't expecting it. I think I was being too optimistic. But I actually, <laughs> I got it right with six. So, um, unfortunately, uh, if, if Roberto isn't here to tally it, did it even count? But, guys, that I, I think that pretty much wraps up uh, this, uh, this episode tonight. Um, uh, do you all have any final thoughts? Not much, man. Just looking forward to another week of uh, USL Championship. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be fun. Busy slate of games coming up. And uh, I, I know we didn't touch on it too much, but uh, glad OC gets their stadium for at least another year. Uh, oh, yes. Cross, it's longer than that. Most definitely. Yeah, that, that is... That is a relatively good ending for, for that situation over with OCSC. Um, we'll see, hopefully, that it, it'll bring in more uh, positive uh, endings for, for that. But I, I know I saw a lot of comments of people saying that the relationship between the team and the city is now pretty much sour, almost to the point of no return. But... Uh, whatever happens to OCSC, you know, we wish the, their fans uh, the best and hopefully that, hopefully it happens. But guys. Cool. Cool. If it's sour, then vote everyone out. That fixes everything. That's, I, that's, I was almost going to say that. I don't know when their elections are, but who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's not, I mean, just a disclaimer. We are not meddling with California elections. Uh, obviously not. <laughs> Maybe but, you're not. Uh, <laughs> um, I am not your lawyer, so I this do not take this as legal or political <laughs> advice. So, but I'm just uh, exercising my right to free as em- assembly and encouraging people in Southern California and the city of Irvine to vote. That's all I'm saying. And, <laughs> More yeah. voting is always good. You are, yeah, that's a really good point. But guys, thank you so much for for listening to to this episode. Um, be sure to go ahead and subscribe to the Striker News, and uh, you know we. Added a lot more coverage in Atlanta, in California. Obviously, we're covering the great the teams in the great state of Texas. So, for the price of a coffee with the mermaid, you get your subscription monthly to the Striker Texas. Am I right or am I wrong? Because Jonathan's looking at me like I'm speaking Chinese or something. Coffee Just to clarify, uh, uh, for a cup of coffee with the mermaid logo, I don't want people thinking that you know you can have a cup of coffee. Oh, with oh okay, Starbucks. <laughs> I'm like, what? Is, is, is this some kind of weird phrase that I've never heard before? Okay, I, I, I've never, I've never heard anyone say that. Kind of like, uh, look, look, the they're not time. sponsoring us. We're not going to give them uh, brand recognition. Okay. <laughs> so, but my point still stands. Um, be sure to subscribe to the to the Striker News. It's cheap. And, subscribe. <laughs> exactly. And, and we can't do this without you. We're here on a mission to support local soccer, and uh, that is, and we cannot do it without your help. Uh, also, be sure to to follow the Striker on all of the social media platforms: Twitter, Instagram. Uh, Facebook as well, and, and uh, interact with us. You know, give us your thoughts about everything that's happening within uh, within uh, soccer at, at at any level. Uh, give us your thoughts, your hot takes. You know, we're here. We're here to to read them, and uh, interact and help the other fan bases grow at a grassroots roots level. But guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see each other next week for another episode of the Striker Texas. Have a good night. This, this, this.